Mindsets based on local prejudices and colonial norms of the country came into a sharp confrontation with the international outlook of Michael Grace. His brother, Dr. John Grace, brought an awareness of the wider world that would set an early opportunity for divergence in the company. In this first decade, many choices regarding change loomed large as the world dynamics changed. The Jamaica Teachers Union strongly recommended compulsory education and this was largely ignored by the colonial government. Grace Kennedy and Company had to take decisions as to the education and retention of employees through apprenticeship. As access to schools was limited and university education was mainly targeted at civil servants with promise. Ten important choices are highlighted here and in a matrix that brings the early years to a close. Some tough and different choices were presented and varying paths were taken by country and company as you will see in the book. Just to mention these choices, to invoke self-determination or cling to dependency was one choice. To pursue private initiative or demand public underwriting. Thirdly, prioritize human capital development or condemn labor to low-skilled tasks. Engage the small man or indulge the privilege. Grasp opportunities quickly and decisively or react sluggishly and half-heartedly to crises. Diversify into new positions or over-invest in old positions. Use geography strategically or disregard geography entirely. The company firmly believed, established a belief that was later succinctly expressed as take what is good for Jamaica and make it good for Grace Kennedy. The next decade really deals with the depression and the world at war again. The recovery from the aftermath of post-World War I was barely underway when the world was confronted by an economic, economic collapse starting on Wall Street, but which swiftly enveloped the entire world. The causes of this devastation could be the subject of a totally separate study but the effects on the country and the company could not be ignored. Having failed to take some appropriate steps in the preceding decade, the country found some disadvantages. One in particular was that the so-called benevolent hand of colonialism found itself constrained by the situation in Europe, accompanied by the need to suspend war reparation payments from Germany to France and British repayments to the USA, as inflation, unemployment, production, and international trade suffered as markets everywhere were depressed. The table that you're probably looking at now, hopefully, is showing you that the wholesale prices dipped in those countries, major countries, by as much as 34%. Industrial production diminished by for, by 23 to 49%, particularly with regard to Germany. Foreign trade was really, really badly hit, and that is where the impact on Jamaica comes. And unemployment had massive increases during that time. The previous self-reliance force during the First World War here in Jamaica seemed to be forgotten strategies. And in general, the malaise of dependency seemed to be at the forefront. For Jamaica, the situation caused a rethinking of tariffs and preferences that had largely kept our two major inefficient industries, namely sugar and bananas, alive. It opened the door to competition from Central America 
thereby giving them unprecedented access to British and European markets. Simultaneously, Panama started a clampdown on non-Panamanians moving between their home base and Panama. This was a major blow for Jamaica as the repatriation of monies overseas relied on returning residents as electronic money transfers had not yet been invented. Thus remittances as a legitimate source of earnings began to falter. The Panama Canal construction, in addition to unskilled and semi-skilled workers, also recruited many skilled Jamaicans who would never return. In an already weak educational environment, the resulting brain drain was to prove a major hindrance to development and was to become a recurring decimal. The death of Fred W. Kennedy in 1930, and closely followed by R.P. Galway, the company's secretary, produced the first crisis of succession, and the management of this proved to be an enduring quality that has been maintained to this day. James Moss Solomon Sr. was appointed managing director, and the young Louis Fred Kennedy came under his guidance at the board. Louis Fred Kennedy would emerge as one of the great business minds, fair employer, and resolute Jamaicans of the century. In the middle of the decade, James Moss Solomon Sr. also brought in a recent high school graduate, Selwyn Carlton, Carlton Alexander. Between these three men, the baton passed over nearly seven decades until the death of Carlton Alexander in 1989. It proved to be a smooth transition, following through to Rafael Diaz, Douglas Arrain, and today, Don Webby. Even as the country remained wedded to inefficient agriculture, the company diversified into wharf operations with partners, Jamaica Fruit and Shipping Limited, into manufacturing, insurance, and distribution in totally new ways. So even as the Great Depression, followed by the Second World War, unleashed their challenges, the company grew by innovation and without the desire or need for government payload. The company responded to the hardships of Jamaica exacerbated by the uncaring colonial government, and Grace Kennedy invested in developing sources of supply, shipping, and an overland supply route across Cuba that alleviated many wartime difficulties and kept the country eating. I think at that time the company bought a boat and refitted it and ran the gauntlet of the submarines between um, Santiago and King and um, Kingston, uh, and it was very, very useful. Goods were landed in Havana and taken by rail across Cuba. And this is what kept Jamaica going during that time. The Governor Edward Denham's statement in 1938 simply showed the level of his contempt for our rural peasantry. I quote, it's useless to give a sick an uneducated man who cannot earn enough to keep himself, himself out of the arms house at the end of his life, a road for the transport of produce which he has neither the money nor the strength to cultivate." End of quotation. This was not in keeping with the ethos and values of the company with regard to country. But the company's actions pursued the established core values. It proved good for both. The country had supplies, and Grace Kennedy had a cachet with the people that would grow dramatically, and their support has continued. In that time, the commitment towards leadership and speaking out and acting for what was right was indelibly stamped on the employees, and the, con and the tradition continues today. The rivalry and friendship that developed between Alexander Bustamante and Louis Fred Kennedy would set the tone for ongoing collaborations that saw great 
stability, and opportunities for port development going forward. It was certainly embraced by the visionary Louis Fred Kennedy, and he led the establishment of the company superannuation fund, medical scheme, share ownership, and group life that were certainly major achievements and revolutionary innovations at that time, and set a benchmark for the country that has not really been emulated. 